to start with, I extend a um, warm welcome to everyone who is present here and a big thanks for uh, to talk to Keith for taking out time for this uh, talk to interact with Delhi Comparators on this platform. Uh, so I would like to introduce uh, this academic group called Delhi Comparatives. Um, it is an initiative in the direction of uh, studying Indian literary scenario with themes of transmediality and interdisciplinarity serving as the cornerstones. Starting in, uh, started in uh, 20, 2010 by teachers and students of University of Delhi, uh, the group's primary thrust is to develop a critical understanding of uh, cultural and sociopolitical dynamics in a multicultural uh, Indian landscape. All our current and forthcoming events and research projects embrace literary three themes like comparative studies, literary historiography, pluralistic epistemology, marginal centricism, spatiality, digital humanities, and so on. We emphatically endeavor to create a sustainable and socially relevant hub that engages with and enhances the tools, methodology, theory, and approaches analogous to these dynamically interactive uh, areas of study. In this particular vein, the subgroup of uh, rhetoric studies maneuvers to investigate the quintessential role of language, symbols, and signs in organizing a sustainable uh, social, in, or, uh, in organizing and, sust uh, the, and sustaining the social groups, constructions of meanings and identities, creation of knowledge and production of change in any community, particularly in South Asia, where the multicultural societies constantly find themselves at the fringe of, fringes of experiencing fundamental changes. So we have uh, Professor Keith today with us uh, to give us, uh, you know, like to share his work on um, the, the, the theme of rhetoric, the rhetoric studies in the Indian context. Um, Dr. Keith is a professor of English at Kent State University, Stark. He has spoken worldwide on comparative rhetoric, the rhetoric of India, feminist argumentation, and argumentation theory. His publications include articles in Rhetoric Review, Rhetorica, Rhetoric Society Quarterly, College English Association Forum, Journal of Advanced Composition, uh, Intertext and Foreign Languages and Literary Studies, and Advances in History of Rhetoric, and in chapters edited for these collections. Uh, Dr. Lloyd is the chair of the Non-Western Global Rhetorics uh, Standing Group of College Composition and Communication and the executive director of the International Association Intercultural Communication Studies. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Keith, today. Um, uh, we are very happy to have you here and we all are really looking forward to um, your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really glad. Uh, that Amitavak uh, contacted me about this. Let me get my presentation up. I'm going to split screen it a bit because it, uh, if you have your cameras on, it helps me to be able to see uh, what you're doing. The trouble is it's not allowing me to do this. Uh, you're unable to share the screen, is it? Okay. Can you see a split screen with the talk on one side? Yes, we can. All right, so if I have a few cameras on, at least I feel like I'm talking to some people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was good. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let me start off by saying thank you to uh, uh, the leadership of the Comparatus. I'm glad you reached out to me. I'm really grateful that you did. I'd also like to thank Hannah Jones, who has uh, been my assistant in putting this together. She's been invaluable. Also, I just want to thank for inspiration, Dr. Uma Krishnan, who might be here this morning. I, I, did, I think she might have had a time conflict, but she uh, she was the one who trained me in the AI rhetoric, which is what I do my research on. Um, and Dr. Lu Ming Mao, who's been a, a mentor to me in this field, and also Amika Singh, who's just been a great friend and encourager. So let me begin. I want to talk about each word in my title and why I picked those particular words. So I chose reasoning, but I'm gonna talk about rhetoric and I'll explain why in a second. Because I believe that rhetoric is how we reason with ourselves and with others. So I see them not as equivalent because I think sometimes reason is more about um, uh, thinking with your mind where I think rhetoric has more to do with thinking with your whole being. 
So what I mean by rhetoric is that it's more than mental. It involves logos, ethos, pathos. So logic, emotions, um, the way that we come across. And it's not just about persuasion as far as I'm concerned, even though a lot of people think of it that way. I don't think that it is a Greek word even anymore. It might have been at one time. Um, and I don't think it's even an English word, although a lot of uh, languages have come into it through English. And it's used wherever English is spoken around the world. I'm sure it's a familiar term in India as well. I know that it is. And it's used in hundreds of other languages. So I don't see any reason why we can't use the word rhetoric because I don't think that it is a Greek word anymore. I also don't believe that rhetoric is a matter of rhetoric versus reality. I believe we cannot frame it reality, no matter what we think reality is, without rhetoric. So scientists use rhetoric as well as politicians or anyone else. So what is it in my view? I think it's the shaping of the what and the how. This is a simple way that I put it for my students. The what is our message and the how are all the choices that we make, our tone, our vocabulary, our language, our dialect, our idiolect, the media we choose, register conventions. When you think about any message that you need to send out, there's so many different ways that you could send it. To me, that is rhetoric. That is what rhetoric is. That way it doesn't, it isn't moving completely away from what Aristotle said, but I think it has changed so much in what it includes. So the how shapes the what, the what shapes the how. And rhetoric from this point of view is the active shaping of what and how in any communicative act. And this can be conscious or unconscious, but the field of rhetoric has to do with the conscious shaping of the way that we communicate. I chose the word Occident and of course made a little uh, play on words. Reasoning is not Occidental. And the word of course is very familiar to most all of us. So it means the part of the sky where the sun sets literally but of course it's come to mean Europe and America, the opposite of the East or the Orient. And ever since Edward Said's uh, fantastic book on Orientalism, uh, we've come to see it as um, mostly a colonialist bias. And we'll get into that in a second. So comparative is the next word. What do I mean by comparative? And I'm going to be giving a second talk to this group about uh, comparative in a few weeks. So comparative, the problem of comparison is you're assuming that you're starting with something. And comparative rhetoric assumes uh, that you have a knowledge of Greek rhetoric to begin with. So how can we study non-Western or non-Greek rhetorics without imposing our own terms and our own perspectives on them is the concern of comparatives to the point that I have um, talked with some of my uh, colleagues and, and we've tried to come up with other words besides comparative, but it's, we're kind of stuck with it. And I think it's a good word because it does relate to so many fields. So for scholars like Lu Ming Mao and others, uh, we begin with the knowledge of Greek rhetoric, at least in this field, uh, but we avoid branding similar practices as versions or distortions. We don't just go, well, that's just like Aristotle said, or we don't say well, Aristotle said it better. We try to avoid those two. Um, and it seeks to understand non-Western rhetorics on their own terms and context, which is what I'll do by example today. And we're trying to bring new knowledge into the field, expand what we mean by rhetoric. As I tell people all the time, nobody was born saying enthymeme or syllogism. So these are not natural words to anyone. We can always bring new words in from other cultures. And it makes the study of rhetoric global. All right, so what do I mean by Hindu? Uh, with this audience, I don't think I have to explain a whole lot, but um, what I know that I'm talking about here is it's not originally an Indian word. It was used by the Greeks and the Persians for the people beyond the Indus of the Hindu River. And, and up until the 19th or 20th century, it wasn't really used by Hindus themselves. And I believe that it is a complex dynamic pattern of life and practice. It's more of an ethos than a set of beliefs and it's a complex social system and it's elaborately articulated religious sensibility. It's kind of all of those things. I'm going to look particularly at Nyaya philosophy. It is a Hindu philosophy um, because of these reasons. Uh, it was developed by Vedic scholars. Um, they allied it with a philosophical system um, of thought and they modified it through interchanges with Buddhist scholars. So it developed over the centuries. 
and it became a part of uh, Brahminical teaching, but it's moved far beyond that. Uh, and I chose Hindu because it's not equivalent to Indian, although in a lot of my early publications, I'm, I will admit I said Indian rhetoric because that was kind of the way things were when I started in this field. But a friend of mine from Nepal pointed out, hey, uh, you know, we have Nyaya too. So I wanted to make sure that it's not equivalent to Indian. This is a this is a Southeast Asian or South Asian philosophy. All right, so um, in 2005, I reinterpreted the Nyaya Sutra as a rhetorical handbook and a presentation in Strasbourg, France, and that I had a lot of help with that from my friend Uma Krishnan, whom I think has joined. By 2017, Nyaya rhetoric was officially recognized by Indian philosophers. So at first, there were some questions about what I was trying to do, how, why I was seeing it as a rhetorical book, as well as a book of philosophy. Um, but I think the questions have mostly been ironed out because it doesn't change that it's a philosophy just because it has rhetorical aspects. According to Janankar, I is as much a part of Indian argument traditions Again, using that phrase, Indian argument traditions as Aristotelian thought in the West, and I'm proceeding from that assumption. So here's what my presentation is about. I'm offering my work and the rhetoric as an example of a comparative approach to rhetorical communication. But I think the principles, of course, are applicable more widely, and I'll talk about that in the next presentation. So first of all, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to define a world or global rhetoric that, rather than non-Western to move past that negative term. Um, I'm trying to see rhetorical communication practices emerging from local and regional contexts. So not dependent on or influenced necessarily by Greek concepts. Uh, I want to increase the field's lexicon and concepts I want to move beyond similarities and differences to really truly understand and create a global rhetorical literacy. So let's get started. Hopefully a lot of you are already familiar a little bit with Nyaya philosophy. I'll give a quick overview and forgive me, it's, I'm leaving a lot of things out, uh, just to keep it simple and to keep it focused for today. If you have questions or concerns, we can talk about them later. All right, so it's a Hindu Vedic philosophy guiding practitioners to moksha, deliberation from desire, fear, and rebirth. What makes it unique is that uh, the path to moksha uh, does involve meditation. It talks about that, but it involves um, conversation. And I think it's kind of unique in that aspect. Uh, the Nashitra was written by Akshapada Gautam around 150 CE. And uh, it reflects the teachings from Meraditi Gautam probably about 550 BCE, so, so all the way back in the Buddhist period. The sutra itself, there are five chapters and 502 quick aphorisms. The main commentary is by Vatsyayana. Um, from about the second or third century, most of the time, if you read uh, the Naya Sutra, his comments are right, are published next to or as a part of the document. He also is traditionally known as the author of the Kama Sutra, fun note. All right, Navya Nyaya emerged in the 13th century CE, uh, uh, basically in the homeland of uh, Meraditi Gautam. And also you can see that it was um, influential also in Bengal. All right, so at this point, it's part of the Brahmin caste teaching traditions. Let me talk about the basis of it. The basis of everything are that there are four valid means of knowledge that I'll explain in a second. The sutra says that the supreme felicity or moksha is obtained by the knowledge of the true nature of 16 categories. So by studying and practicing these 16 categories, we can attain moksha. All right, so we have the means of valid knowledge, the four I'll get to in a second. We have objects of valid knowledge, which are both internal and external. And I see it as rhetorical because it begins with doubt. And Aristotle would say something like it begins with debate. What is something that we, we have doubts about? And from that doubt, we develop a purpose. I want to find an answer to that. And then we begin to look for analogies because most of us, all of us, 
cannot conceptualize something new without thinking in what ways is it similar to or analogous to something I already understand. And then we reach a tentative conclusion. And this, the heart of Nyaya philosophy is the Abhyava, which are the five part Nyaya method of presenting ideas. You could call it a rhetorical method, a logical method, um, but that's, that's what it is. Then it goes to the step of if then argumentation, which is Tarka. There's a Tarka Shastra, which would be basically debate, the philosophy of debate. Uh, there's Nirnaya, which is ascertainment, and Vara. Now, it, um, the Nyaya Sutra distinguishes among these three different approaches to reasoning. It sees Vara as the most fruitful because it's seeking um, a mingling of minds, a shared perspective. So the, the goal of the conversation is liberation from, from doubt and from fear and from illusion. Uh, so it leads to moksha. But they admit that there are other kinds of arguments, arguments just to win, jalpa, and vitanda, which is arguing just against. And I think all of us are familiar with that experience. We've all had friends who just argue against. And uh, Western philosophy focuses a lot more on argument to win. These are all con uh, discussions on fallacies. I'm going to move on because I don't think that's going to be relevant to our discussion today. All right. But it's just different ways that the method can fail. All right. So basically, the pramana are the way that we know the world. The, world mean, the word means literally perceptible to the mind. Mana is mind. And actually, the English word is still a relative of that in an European dialect. So, begin with pratyaksha. So, the basis of all knowledge is what we see and what we feel. But uh, again, I included what we feel and see in an inner sense. All right, so it means the way things appear. Anumana, which is inference. Um, again, mana, and it means through the mind. And then upamana, comparison, which means above the mind, literally, and shabda. So this is the process. We create shabda. We create trustworthy testimony through these three processes. We, um, we see something happening, and we make inferences about them. We use a concrete example, and then we make some comparisons, and we create shabda. All right, so this will probably make that more clear. This is the classic um, iteration of how you explain uh, the five part, the avyava. The avyava, uh, the word means the members, but it's like the, the fingers on the hand, like five fingers on the hand. All right, so prachna is the hill is on fire. So you make an observation. This potentially is shapta if it's confirmed. So this would be maybe the hypothesis if you want to call it that word. All right, the hetu, because there's smoke, the reason I think there's fire on the hill is because I see smoke. So I'm making an inference. And then the reason that I'm making that inference, I tie it in with a drishtanta, which is a clear analogy where I've seen smoke and fire together in the physical world. So I'm, I'm, I'm connecting it to a perception. All right. So then you use a prominent comparison, the hill, it, I look back again and go, yeah, that seems to be the case. And then uh, we agree, or I agree with myself, depending on whether it's an internal argument or external argument, we agree. And nigmana is a binding of the minds, right? So we bind our minds together that this is truly what's happening. Of course, this is just an example. Um, let me give you a, a modern iteration of it. So you could say, prajna, all beings are one. Had to because they're made up of the same materials, same DNA. And the drishtanda would be like glasses of water dipped from the ocean. So I use this example with my students to show them, and, and they immediately get what they're talking about. Okay, so what's in the what's in the glass? The ocean. What's in the ocean? The ocean. And they get it, you know, that we are all glasses of water dipped from the ocean. And I'll even ask them to trace out the implications of that. I'll say, well, what does that mean? What happens when you die? And they pour the water back into it. They just automatically kind of turn up the cup, the invisible cup they have in their hand. And uh, so 
I think uh, yeah, yeah, it's just immediately understandable. It creates connections. I, when I use this with my students, I think they understand something about Hinduism that they didn't understand before, and they can't unthink it. They might disagree. They might not think that's the way that it works, but uh, they they get it. It becomes uh, an experience. So the what's unusual here is this connection with this thing in the physical world. And as Mahanti says, uh, it's because the neologician wanted to make sure that it wasn't just formally valid, but it was connected to material reality. Nyaya philosophers are very materialist. They believe the world is here, that we are reacting to it, and that we could properly understand it and our role in it. Now, let me make a little comparative moment. I'll run through this quickly because I, I know you guys are familiar with the Greek syllogism. All right, so where... Um, which isn't necessarily directly from Aristotle, but it's the way that it's come through the years. Where there's smoke, there's fire, there's smoke on the hill, therefore there's a hill's on fire. Notice that Nyaya begins with the conclusion, so it's inverting that process. Um, um, Hendra Jane says it's, it's actually a more scientific approach to reasoning. Uh, Nyaya begins with the Greek conclusion, and then the second element, the reason is similar, but what is unique about Nyaya is it adds the avyava. Now later on, um, Naya philosophers added something called vyapti, which means uh, that, that things are, are equal, that this, this is, a, this is a, the right relationship. Um, so they sort of added a smoke on the hill. Uh, I mean, uh, where there's smoke, there's fire, but they added it to the drishtanta to say where there's smoke, there's fire, as in the, the hearth, the kitchen, the fireplace. Okay, so they did add an element to that, maybe a little bit in reaction to Greek philosophy. All right, um, maybe just because it just made some sense, but they connected it differently. All right, so let me go into the goal in the I rhetoric is moksha liberation from uh, fear and pain and desire. All right, so the sutra itself says pain, birth, activity, faults, and misapprehension. I mean, just and misapprehension. In the successive annihilation of these in reverse order, their fall is released. Okay, that's confusing to everyone that reads it. So if you put it in the other order, it's more clear what he's saying. Say, I have many misapprehensions of the world. I don't really understand what's happening around me. And those misapprehensions lead to faults. That leads to desires for things that I shouldn't desire. I'm afraid of things that I don't need to be afraid of. Or I'm just stupid. I just don't really know what's going on. Um, But if I change the misapprehensions, if I truly see what's happening in the world, then I will no longer have false desires and aversions. I will no longer be stupid. And my activities will change. Thus, my karma will change. And there you go. Well, you move out of the cycles um, to, of pain and birth and into moksha. Okay. So again... This is far different from Aristotelian rhetoric, um, where the goals are simply to win, uh, or, or win people over, or get people to move in one direction. All right, so Nyaya rhetoric uses the avyava, a combination of claim, reason, and analogy to frame vada, which is fruitful discussion based on mutual benefit, what is good for the community. It focuses on moksha rather than winning, which is hard to do. I asked my students one time, if you take away winning from argument, and if you take away desire and fear, what's left? And one of them said, justice. And I was stunned because that's exactly what the word yeah, it means, justice. All right, so I'm sorry I left my email on it. I had to get in it, into it to get back, so you're hearing the little dings. Okay. So, focuses on moksha, it stresses vada, and we weigh the results of dialogue by bala, by fruit. So we're looking for something that's fruitful for all engaged. Let me make a comparative moment. Simon says, all Aristian dialectic falls within this class of wrangling, jalpa, but Aristotle believed the end of victory could be approached via the means of fair and unprejudiced argument which a lot of us believe in when we teach argumentation theory. But 
as he says, this is obviously not the case with Hindu argument. If the goal is victory, the means will be spurious. So the goal isn't win-win uh, in, in a Western sense, but more in a broad sense. What is just? What is right? What is best? All right. Also, another comparative moment. Socrates objected to rhetoric because he said it wasn't focused on truth and it made the worst sound best. And yes, rhetoric can be used to those ends, as we all know. But Arist and Aristotle codified rhetoric. He, uh, he said it was in the realm of the debatable. We needed it. And he focused on the rhetor using rhetoric to promote the rhetor's interest. These are overstatements, but just by contrast, yaya is a combination of the two. It's a philosophy which seeks truth, so Socrates would be happy, but it also is a way of working through problems in the real world, a rhetorical method of reasoning. Bingo, it fits what Aristotle was desiring. Neither one of them actually came up with this combination. It's interesting that in India, they did. All right, so what makes unique the five-part of Yava? The focus on knowing episodes. What do I mean by that? According to Roy Perret, a prama is a, re is a knowing episode, a knowing. A knowing episode is an awareness or an experience that is a culmination or end product of perceptual inferential process. All right, so what he's saying is, the goal of Nyaya argument is to state this particular five-part syllogism at the key point of the message so that it becomes this summary and a point of enlightenment, a point where the audience goes, I, I get it. Okay, so it has that kind of power. There's some evidence that the word enthymeme, which means to think with the mind or uh, to understand with the mind, that the enthymeme originally meant something similar in Greek culture. Interesting, fun fact. All right, so the rhetorical goal is moksha rather than just winning. It's em emphasis on vada, and it combines a full philosophy with a rhetorical method of reasoning. So there you go. I want to back up a little bit and talk a little bit about its history, and then we'll look at some current examples. Uh, Naya was adopted by the Buddhists. There's some evidence that perhaps it was co-invented uh, with Buddhist and Hindu interchanges, even though, of course, Hindu is a modern term. All right, so it was used for inter and intra-school debates, and debates were common public events. Also, as this picture shows, that if the person was considered to have won in the debate, then uh, the other person would become the follower of that person. Now, I don't expect you to read this whole thing, but that's basically what this says, that debate was a part of uh, the ancient culture for centuries. All right. In the sutra itself, there are many different now, arguments, here's just a couple of them. The Veda is reliable, like the spell or, and the medical science, because of the reliability of their authors. It's a very different view of why the Veda is reliable. Um, it kind of sidesteps the idea of whether or not it was written by God or authored by God and says, basically, it's authoritative because it's authoritative, because it makes sense to people and it works. Uh, the means of knowledge, pramanas, cannot be denied. They are established in the same manner a drum is proved by its sound. So, lots of Nyaya arguments in the sutras. In terms of its rhetorical origins, if you look at my work, I've found uh, examples in the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Mahayana, the Mahabharata, uh, and the, the Bhagavad Gita. Um, so, similar debate practices are codified uh, according to one of my, some of my research in Indian republics, which were uh, in the Buddhist area, they lasted about a thousand years. Uh, so there were, it was being developed all over uh, northern India at that time. And we also see it codified, some of its principles codif codified in the Karvaka Sam Samhita. Karvaka is a completely different discipline. So there's evidence that these ideas were very, very widespread. All right. So, historically, Naya reaches Europe in the Raj period. Uh, colonial philosophers, you know, quote, discovered these texts and brought them to Europe. Many saw them as derivative of Greek philosophy. Some said this is a primitive step towards Greek philosophy, very Orientalist assumptions. In the 19th and 20th century, Indian scholars began to promote and defend Naya as a legitimate and unique philosophy. 
about this time during this time it was translated into english you can get it online pretty it's pretty available these days um and these scholars um Mahanti, Matalal, Ganeri, and Amartya Sen are promoting it. Um, not everyone here, uh, Matalal has passed away, but uh, these are scholars that are doing the work now. All right, so Rutgers look for instances. I'm trying to find instances of this happening in the text. So I want to look at a couple of examples and then we'll uh, call it a day. Um, what I'm looking for are the prajna, hetu, and drishtanta, usually in order. The, it's, it's an attempt to share a, a Vedic relationship, and it encapsulates the whole perspective in a knowing episode. And it seeks fruitful solutions and perspectives. Okay, probably only have time for this one. I have two prepared, but we'll go with this one. Maybe I'll do the other one to see what our time is. All right, so... This is from, uh, I'm sure you, uh, most of you know, uh, know Sunny uh, as an actor. No country can progress unless it becomes conscious of its being, its mind and its body. It has to learn to exercise its own muscles. It has to learn to solve its problems its own way. But whichever way I, I turn, I find that even after 25 years of independence, we are like a bird, which has been let out of its cage after a prolonged imprisonment, unable to know what to do with its freedom. It has wings, but it is afraid to fly into the open air. It longs to remain within defined limits as in the cage. All right, so clearly this is a Nyaya argument. It's actually in order. If we look at it, he's making the pra prajna. No country can progress unless it's conscious of its being, mind, and body. He gives a reason for that. It has to learn to exercise its own muscles. It has to solve its problems its own way. And in an analogy that pulls it together, the bird in the cage. All right, so what makes this powerful? I think it's powerful because it is a Nyaya argument. Uses the prajna, hetu, drishtanta. He speaks in a Vedic matter as one of the audience. If you look at the context, he says he, he speaks as one who grew up in colonial rule with a sense of inferiority, um, beginning his career by imitating European art, education, and language to gain credibility, something I think a lot of Indian people would identify with. His focus is on a fruitful outcome, the growth of the country. And the bird said free is the knowing episode that encapsulates really his whole point of view that India needs to break the bonds of colonialism. All right, there's a second one. Uh, India is a child on his father's shoulders. This is put forth by a scientist um, trying to say that even though this sage was a great philosopher, we don't have to believe in ghosts just because he believed in ghosts. So he says whatever he wrote in books is true, uh, but it doesn't mean it's a reputable truth. And this doesn't diminish his, great men, his greatness a wee bit. So it's a controversial argument, but he makes a very Nyaya argument. We've climbed a huge ladder of 700 years since the sage spoke, and we now see from sitting on his shoulders, like a child elevated on his shoulders, on his father's shoulders. So again, same thing. The knowing episode this time is that we can acknowledge the truths of the wise people from the past and acknowledge the truth we see from the vantage point of the present. They're both true. We just see a little further than the person in the past. So he's trying to at least move beyond superstition in the country. All right, I'm gonna close out. If comparative approaches are successful, the field of rhetoric is significantly changed. Boundaries are crossed and vocabulary and concepts are expanded. Greek rhetoric to me is one interpretation of countless other interpretations. It's not lost its value, it's lost its preeminence. Rhetoric begins to be decolonized, and even the whole idea of calling Greek rhetoric Western is beginning to be questioned, and rightly so. All right, so to end. Now, your rhetoric is evidence that Greek reasoning and rhetoric are not universal. It provides an alternate, more productive rhetoric than focused, just focused on winning. And learning the rhetorical practices of other people increases our depth of understanding, provides models for other communication practices, and helps restore traditions lost or downplayed um, within um, colonial cultures. So, opens the, ex the exploration of rhetorical practices worldwide. Comparative rhetoric values Greek rhetoric without valorizing it, and enables us to see that learning a language of place is not enough. We need to learn how the people present ideas to one another and how they solve conflicts, what they talk about, 
and how they choose to talk about that. All right then, thank you. If you are interested in checking out um, the Global Non-Western Rhetorics that I am uh, co-chair with Alif Guller, then uh, here are the addresses. I'm sure we can get those posted on LinkedIn. All right, so we have some time for questions, concerns, observations. Thank you, Kate. Um, okay, I think I've been meeting you is uh, almost after 11 years before which I had to spend three months with your manuscript on Nyaya. Ah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I see uh, that when we look at the questions, I don't see. Okay. Okay. Let's start with the first question. Uh, can you read the chat? Uh, I don't have it up. Okay, okay, then I, I'll, I'll read out. Not a problem. So there's a question from Abhishek Pundit, who is saying, thank you for a wonderful presentation. It has given me much to think about. However, I wonder, thinking about Greek lineage of word rhetoric, would it be fruitful to equate Nyaya philosophy with rhetoric or reasoning? Nyaya is still well enshrined in Astika philosophy, yeah. Imposing limits on its rhetoric, wouldn't Lokayata or Mimansa be a better choice? What was the last part of that, the very last sentence? Ah, wouldn't Lokayata or Mimansa would be a better choice? That's a, oh shoot, that's a darn good question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's concentrate um, on this one. Uh, because uh, Nyaya is still well enshrined in Astika philosophy, right? Uh, will it be fruitful to equate Nyaya with rhetoric or reasoning? I, I think it is fruitful um, for the reason that uh, I tried to at least highlight quickly. I believe that it has rhetorical origins, right? I think it was a method of conveying and expressing uh, disagreements, um, and that was in, that was ubiquitous, and that Nyaya um, made it into a philosophy, right, and, and enshrined it into a philosophy. So I'm not saying that it's not a philosophy because, of course, it is. Um, but what I'm saying is that I believe that it had origins in the people. I believe that it uh, this that the philosophers were. Uh, like Aristotle was, uh, just taking ideas that were common in his time and codifying them. So um, I think it's very fruitful to say that it has aspects, rhetorical aspects. And I would say that uh, the, the Agaba uh, are rhetorical methods of reasoning. Um, and that way, I think you're kind of doing both because they're they're logical, but I believe they're 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 more impactful than just simple uh, logic as abstracted mentally. If that makes any sense. And maybe if I'd have started with mem Mimamsa or something like that, I might have gone that direction. And uh, I still want to. I still want to look at some of the other traditions, Tarka Shastra. I want to study them, but um, I began with Nyaya, and I had to kind of to go with that because it just seemed so apparent to me when I read the book that it was rhetorical and it needed to be talked about in our field. I hope that was helpful. I don't think your mic is on. Uh, I'd like to add to what, uh, Kate, what you uh, have argued. I don't know why uh, the question brings in Mangsa here. Because Mimangsa in its Purva form, Purva Mimangsa deals with the Vedic texts and uh, Karma Mimangsa actually talks of and deals with the rituals. Yeah. So I wouldn't really understand why Mimangsa should be actually brought in here when we are talking about 
um, reasoning or rhetoric. Right. So out of the six, uh, and also, I mean, this uh, when it says that uh, can we equate it with uh, the Greek lineage because Nyaya is an Astika school, I mean, Mimansa is also uh, an Astika school. I don't know whether Avishek is here or not. Uh, it would have been lovely to know why Mimansa should come here. In yeah. fact, I agree with you that if we look at the six philosophies uh, or philosophical schools, yeah. Nyaya specifically dealt with reasoning and reaching a truth through argumentation. Right. Um, so I would uh, rather agree with you that uh, to understand how that ancient culture wanted to conceptualize rhetoric and reasoning, Nyaya is the, would be the branch in which you should look into. Yeah. Um, not Mimamsa, really. The reason um, that I mentioned Mimamsa is because uh, some of the refinements of Nyaya thinking were in reactions to some of the other schools. So I am interested in, in that. How, how each one kind of shaped the other. But yeah, yeah I, I don't think that was the place to look for debate practices. Because Vimansa deals, as I said, the first part deals with the Vedic texts, how to yeah. understand those. And also the second part actually deals with yagas and other rituals, how to perform those. So I'm not so sure why it came. Yeah. Okay. You have a question from Robert Wallace Bagan. Uh, dear Kate, thank you for a wonderful lecture. I knew you made a good choice in selecting you as executive director of the International Association for Intellectual Communication Studies. As president of IAICS 1719, I can tell you that you are okay. We are very proud of you. Thank you, Robert. From, <laughs> we are also feeling proud that we have invited Kate. Mm, okay. Yes, I'll be speaking at that conference pretty soon. Yeah. So okay. that'll be available. Okay. There is a question from Shimoyi Chattopadhyay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I would like to know a bit more about Tarka, Vada, Jalpa, and Vitanda. When all of them are dealing with argumentation. Um, it, according to um, Anna's uh, reaction to it, it was... Um, that the goal is um, vada, this this seeking fruitful knowledge. But uh, he says, you know, but other people aren't going to be that fair, right? And so you have to understand when people are arguing just to win, you know, who are just maneuvering. Um, and there are different words in the sutra for uh, what they could be doing. Chala is another good one, which just means, uh, you know, quibble, just quibbling about things. Uh, and these are... So the Nyaya philosopher has to be trained, or I would say the Nyaya rhetoric needs to be trained in uh, arguing to win. And in fact, uh, Vatsyano says, uh, at times, uh, time is so short, that just win, you know? When, when you know something is good for the community and it has to be done, you know, then that's when you use um, that argument. Now, Vitanda, I, I think just to argue against I think the school itself is speaking um, in a way to the skeptics, uh, the different skeptical schools that were in uh, um, Bharat at the time that um, a lot of people in the West don't know that there were skeptical schools who doubted everything. Uh, but I think it's also addressing sometimes uh, the Buddhist complaints, you know, that, that this doesn't work, but when you go, well, what does, they don't have an answer, right? So it's not fruitful, but you need to understand that some people are just arguing to argue. And so that becomes uh, useless. So the, the, the sutra is saying, you've got to learn these ways of arguing. You have to understand them. You have to understand how they work. But at the same time, in a way, it's kind of saying, you have to have some room for Greek rhetoric, but that's not uh, what the focus of Vada is or the focus of Nyaya. And of course, in the history of Nyaya, there are people who just flat out won, you know, just this went for the jugular and won. But I think uh, it was always, I think, with, with those kinds of good ends. 
the other thing is I didn't mention is there is no relation, historical relation between Greek rhetoric and yeah, yeah. For a while, people wondered, well, is one an interpretation of the other? You know, did perhaps yeah, yeah, emerge first and then Aristotle codifies something similar that he tried to improve on in his culture or, or the reverse? There's no evidence that there was contact between the two schools of thought while they were developing. Of course, once we get into the early modern era, you know, into the CE period, there's going to be more and more relations as they go along and they're going to affect each other. But in, his, in their inceptions, they didn't affect each other. And I think that's an example of really uh, polymorphism where two things just appear on the planet that are very similar, but they fit their own cultures. They emerge from their own cultures in their own unique ways. Hope that was a helpful answer. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, I mean, I, it, it, okay. Uh, thank you, Kate. So I'll just add, is that going? I don't know. I'm hearing my voice. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> so I'll add to that, you know, uh, okay, uh, I'll not go into that discussion now because you have put Gautama before Charaka and others because you have put Gautama in around 500 BC, right? And Naraditi, the, the the kind of legendary figure that you, you see yeah, in some, some yeah. of the others. And uh, I usually put Charaka before that, but okay. Uh, <clears throat> to add to this, uh, uh, this whole structure developed, as you have uh, also pointed out, that uh, because the Sanskrit scholastic scholarly system had this notion of debate as the only method to understand and establish one's own position. Yeah. And hence, there would be these uh, vadas where scholars are searching for truth or those who are arguing are searching for just truth. So no yeah. one wins. And there would be the other options where I'm fighting just to win or I'm fighting just to negate the other position. Yeah, just to survive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so there please. is a question from yeah. Go ahead. There's a question from Charulika Dhawan. Mm -hmm. So after thanking you, she has written uh, when you say occidental, it presumes the presence of the oriental, which is in a continuous process of composing and being composed by the occidental. Yes. What types of hierarchies do you see in here in the shaping of Nyaya? <laughs> wow, that's a complicated question, um, yeah. but but a good one. I think I chose Occidental as uh, to actually poke fun of it and to 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 point out that it's ridiculous that somehow uh, a specific group of people on the planet figured out how rhetoric or reasoning works, and that everybody else is just catching up, right? And they're they're not so. To me, the whole thing, the goal is to disintegrate both terms. I don't think they're helpful. They're not useful, but I, it did make a darn good play on words for the title that probably got some of your attention to say, uh, you know, reasoning is not occidental and it is not oriental. If you want to follow the other reverse, it is human, right? And I think it's important to know how all human beings reason with each other, because I know for a fact, you see all the time people making mistakes and not understanding how another culture argues, how they how they set up ideas, how they, they propose changes. And if you go wandering in there thinking there's only one way to do this, um, you can cause more problems than, than respond to. So basically we need to dissolve both of those terms. I think they're, they're meaningless. And then we need to explore the different ways that people have developed indigenous ways of reasoning. This is why I edited uh, a book on, on comparative world rhetoric, because there's so many people doing this kind of work in, in so many different places, from Turkey to South America, Africa, African-Americans, people in Ireland looking at traditions that, that were uh, part of the Greek tradition, but specifically Irish. So uh, people all over the world who are looking at, at traditions of reasoning in their own cultures, talking about them, bringing them to the light. A lot of work has been done in China. 
a lot in Korea, Japan is beginning. Um, and I encourage people everywhere, wherever you're from, think about the rhetoric. I even have rhetoric of my home state <laughs> in Kentucky. We have specific ways of presenting ideas that a lot of people from the North don't understand. And so they don't get us. They don't get what we're talking about sometimes just because I have more of a Southern point of view. And I'm sure we could get that refined about looking at the differences and how they developed in different places. People want to reason together, but they have different ways of doing it according to their context. That was too long of an answer for that question, but hopefully it helped. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, reasoning isn't Occidental was a uh, rhetorical <laughs> <laughs> composition. And yeah, that really worked. That really communicated well with whoever looked at the title. Uh, there is a question from Kesev Vansal, taking a cue from the theme of this talk. Nyaya as a rhetoric of reasoning is still a Vedic and, and Brahminical system. If we try to envision the term Hindu, in its contemporary sense, is there a reasoning that is not Brahminical Vedic, or is there a system of subaltern reasoning within the larger framework of Hindu reason? Oh man, this is where I need some help. <laughs> but as far as what I can tell from the research that I've done, and I don't think there's anything I haven't seen or read in terms that was related to this topic. Um, I don't think it is a, a, a Brahminical tradition. I think it got uh, the, the, okay, the Nyaya philosophy definitely is a Brahminical tradition, but I don't think Nyaya itself as a practice is isolated. I have, um, especially uh, Uma Krishnan, the, the person who taught me about Nyaya, she uses Nyaya arguments all the time. Um, and most anyone that I've talked to from India has said, yeah, this is the way people present ideas. Um, there are other ways to present ideas that I would say were affected by the British educational system. Uh, so there, there, there would be a mix. Um, but I don't see it. I feel like once it was published and brought to the West, then those days were over. To say that it's purely a Brahminical tradition, uh, as they say here, the horse has left the barn on that one, or the ship has sailed. Um, this is too widely known, and it's widely known amongst uh, philosophers in all places. It isn't necessarily, according to many philosophers, attached to Hinduism. So they also see the method as being separable and usable by scientists or communication scholars. Um, so, but as far as the answer of that, is there, are there other forms that I don't know about that aren't part of the experimental tradition? I would love to know about it. If you have any ideas about that, email me. We can get started thinking about that. I'd love to know. Yeah, something from the subaltern, something. I believe this is part of the subaltern, uh, particularly when we have things that Nyaya Panchats, right? The, the the local assembly groups in villages are actually called Nyaya Panchats. So I think it happens at all levels of society. I don't think the Brahmin culture owns it anymore. Maybe, probably never did. Uh, thank you, Kate. I think I, uh, I, we can add to this that um, most of the, a large number of Nyaya texts were later, public, I mean, composed by Buddhists and Jainas. In fact, yeah, there, is yeah. a, there are works, two volume, three volume works on Buddhist Nyaya logic. Yeah. Uh, they have continued yeah. a lot. Yeah, the and, Naga yeah. reinvented Nyaya. Yeah. And also, perhaps, uh, if we look at Charaka's argument about afterlife and rituals to please gods and departed parents, uh, might be taken as examples of an alternative to Nyaya argumentation. Yeah. Uh, but I'm sure even Charaka won't be considered subaltern, given the society we are talking about. Uh, where education was limited to a particular group. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so I'm coming to the next question. Aniel Monsieur. Now, interesting presentation. Do you consider Western rhetoric avidya? <laughs> ah. 
I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, I think there there is a potential there. This is all leading me and many others to rethink Greek rhetoric. Something, I mean, we, if you really look at Greek rhetoric and the writings of Aristotle and the writings of Plato, their thinking is far more what we would call Eastern. So I, I think there's a potential for viewing things more that way. I, I don't know if I'm answering the question. Can I, can I interrupt for a minute, Keith? Sure. Uh, I think Keith has a point. Uh, this is just, uh, Aniel is asking, do you consider Western rhetoric avidya? So the opposite of vidya, knowledge. So his question is, would you consider the Western rhetoric as not, it's a, you know, as, not the opposite of vidya, which is knowledge and learning. So is that the question? Can any help clarify that a little bit so that? Uh, that yeah. So like, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I'm, uh, 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 Keith knows me as Clyde. So hi, oh, Keith. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. so I was just wondering because, you know, you're, you had a clear presentation on uh, explaining that uh, the, the big difference is that Greek rhetoric is very much focused on trying to uh, win. You know, the, the, the sophists were trying to win, and that's, uh, you know, one of the focal points of Greek rhetoric. Whereas Advitya is, uh, you know, it's not only about uh, ignorance. Uh, but it uh, can take a form of denial or misconception con of the atma, of the soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it is uh, not merely a lack of knowledge, but fundamental ignorance about the phenomenal word. You know, so it's uh, to think that the mundane reality we perceive is not uh, the only and ultimate reality. So the concept of avidya is, uh, if I understand your presentation and your argument, this goes towards uh, not, let's say, 100% avidya, but that you're uh, referring to it in some sense. Did I understand that correctly or not? Okay, yeah. I think I was really clumsily trying to get to that in the sense that um, I'm not so sure that the Greek writers themselves didn't have similar goals for the knowledge. If you look at Plato and his idealistic view of the world, to me, it is not far distant. Both Aristotle and Plato believed in reincarnation. So both um, to some extent. And so, but I think some of the use of it, yeah, is a, is a misperception of reality, a, a wrong step. And it, I think it's obvious where the wrong steps are in our culture today when we're divided so much into parties and factions that, that find no, no vada, no, no common experience, don't even understand reality. It, am I getting to the answer to the question? So to me, I see some potential in Greek rhetoric for more of an abridgment. Um, yeah, I mean, I understand your point. I mean, the Atma Brahma, Brahman is the ultimate reality from uh, right. a Vidya right. point of view and from a Vedic point of view, so yeah. yeah. Makes sense, yeah. And I yeah. think some of the things that Plato and Aristotle said, but especially Plato, uh, about the ultimate reality, they are similar enough. I don't want to equate them because that's doing reverse of what I want to do. But I do think they're similar enough that I, I'd be nervous about saying, I, th I think originally they were far more alike, but the Western culture went off mm -hmm. in this other yeah. direction that I think is not fruitful. Mm -hmm. It's destructive to humans, and we've seen that, you know, in, in our treatment of the planet, our treatment of each other. I, yeah. I don't, I, those yeah. don't show any knowledge of any kind of universalness of human beings whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Great. Thank you for helping me through that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Keith. Thank you, Keith. Uh, so, Abhishek Pundir has... Uh, are sort of a <clears throat> rejoinder. It's about, um, yeah, the first part, uh, Avishek agrees with. And second, uh, there's a comment. Uh, would you find Lokayata closer to Western rhetoric than 
Nyaya. What was it? Uh, would you find Lokayata closer to Western rhetoric than Nyaya? I think uh, here, perhaps the idea that rhetoric, I mean, if we divide, okay, I think you will agree with me, that if we divide Vada, if we take away Vada and concentrate on Jalpa and Vitanda, which would be the rhetoric as we understand rhetoric um, in the Western, I mean, Greek civilization. I think the question is coming from that. Uh, Avishek, if you are here, would you please like to join us for the discussion? Hi. Hi. Uh, so, uh, not actually a question, but I was, you know, slightly thinking on terms of, you know, looking at Buddhist philosophy, Lokayata. And uh, through my personal reading, of course, I'm not a scholar on Lokayata or Mimasa. I uh -huh. find it very close to Western rhetoric. So I was thinking that this could be a very fruitful exercise if we think of Western rhetoric in comparison to Lokayata or vice versa. I, that was just a uh, you know, point that I wanted to make. Uh, nothing more. I welcome that. That's, that's really... Yes, I would like to follow up on that. So feel free to contact me through LinkedIn or something and share with me. Yeah, yeah surely I'll get in touch with uh, Booth. Professor Amitav Chakravarti and you too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just want to make a little comment about this, if you don't mind. Sorry, Keith. I apologize. But uh, I just want to add to Abhishek. I would say Lokayata is more delving into material sustenance and objects, and which is more about the how man is with the, lo the materialistic world, as opposed to Nyaya, which was focused on moksha, which is about divinity. So there is, there are two completely, it's like comparing apples and oranges. So we have to be careful when we kind of uh, intertwine all these different sutras uh, in, uh, into one. So we have to be careful. So I think uh, Keith is more focused on Nyaya and the rhetorical, the Western rhetoric. Um, so that mainly in uh, Aristotle's terms. So I don't know if that will kind of, this will be a parallel line which we could look at, but it was more about materialism, uh, the human being in materialistic world, as opposed mm -hmm. to Nyaya, which is the human being and the moksha, the ka, what is going to happen beyond this life. So uh, it's a good comparison, but it will be more on those grounds. Sorry about taking time away from you, Keith. <laughs> You're always welcome to take time away from me, Omar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, dear. So I hope, Abhishek, that makes a little sense. Yes, you are certainly right, but this will be a different way of approach. Yes. Well, where would I be without you? So you're always welcome to jump in and any, you know. <laughs> Thank you, my dear. You're being very kind. <laughs> anything I got right, it was Uma. Anything I didn't get right, that was probably me. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> You're being very uh, kind. Thank, so thank you. you. Thank you. I would like to add to what you said uh, that, you know, uh, Abhishek, the point is that if you look from the perspective of Nyaya, Lokayata is marked by its not accepting Anumana mm. as one of the yes. sources yes. of valid knowledge. And because that's the case, I don't know how much it can be compared with Western rhetoric in that sense. But okay, I think, yeah, Kate, I, I also think that this opens up a very interesting uh, option to look into. It uh, does. In fact, this might talk about two separate systems of rhetoric working almost parallelly in the same cul culture. So far, we have understood the existence of Lokayata is an alternative philosophy existing there. Uh, but we might look into that. That might become something interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there is a last another question. This is the last one from Kesa Bansal. Could you kindly post the... Okay. These are the posts. Uh, you have... Uh, there is a request uh, to post uh, the links here on the chat box. Uh, it's fine if you cannot do it now. Uh, maybe we can 
do it later also. Yes, the way I've got my computer set up right now, it would be hard for me to get them posted. So I think uh, it would be better, Kesab, if you get in touch with Kate and get the links. I will send them to you, to you uh, so okay, that we, sure. could put them, we could put them on uh, LinkedIn. Yeah. And, okay. and we are, uh, the organization I'm in is, has a LinkedIn site. So um, yeah. it's the Global Non-Western Rhetoric Standing Group. Did I say that right? Oh, Uma, can you send it? Yes, I will do that. I just set up my computer so I had very little on, so I, I would make sure every, you know everything functioned and I didn't um, freeze and <laughs> or you guys would freeze. So I tried to have very little up on my computer. I will try to post it here. Thank okay. You. Okay. Charu, you wanted to say anything? Oh, uh, yeah. I was suggesting that if we have the links, I can uh, post them on the event pages that we have on LinkedIn. So I'll just share them. Uh, everyone can have access to it then from there. Okay. okay. So I'll do that. Fantastic. Okay. So we'll do it later then. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you so many people for coming and uh, yes, I and uh, coming, visiting this site. Uh, so, thank you, Kit. Uh, when we thought that we'll be starting our uh, rhetoric studies group, because you know that in Indian uh, mainstream academia, rhetoric is not a discipline which is studied much. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, um, when we thought of it, I suddenly remembered you. In fact, one of my students read your book from there, sent me an end note, and then I said, yeah, 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 I remember. <laughs> so, uh, so I told Charu that, okay, let's start with him. Uh, that would be the best thing to do. And okay. uh, thank you because you responded fast and we could organize this. In fact, we are planning to organize the first Indian conference on rhetoric uh, by the by the end of 21 or in the beginning of 22 all right then so, uh, i'll really request you and other scholars who are there i'll uh really reach out so that we can make it a success uh, sure. so our group's lecture series begins with you thank you for thank being you. here with us thanks a lot i think there are issues uh, on which there could be debates for long, particularly like I was uncomfortable with the word Hindu because ancient India sounds better to our training. But at yes. the same time, I can understand the logic behind using Hindu. So maybe some other day uh, we I, can delve into these things. But yeah, uh, let me know. I'm always looking for a better way to say all of this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. This was an interesting discussion and also the fact that you have made scholars from disciplines other than rhetoric so comfortable that they could come up with such questions is the yeah. best part of the presentation. Uh, so our sincere gratitude to you. Thank you. I hope we'll soon be in contact and maybe another discussion. I think we uh, have another is, one. Where is the date for the next discussion, Charu? Sir, it's 23rd of March. Okay. So we are meeting again. Yeah. For comparative uh, In the last week of March. And so thank you, Kate. Thank you, those who have joined the discussion. Uh, on behalf of Delhi Comparatives, I thank you all. And with your permission, now I'll close the meeting. All right. Thank, thank you very you, much. Everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Great, great presentation, man. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Good thank to see you, friend. Thank you for coming. See ya. See ya. So I'm closing the meeting. Thank you. <laughs> <All right. laughs>